In a vast wasteland of entertainment where radio has become obsolete, stands an embittered man teetering at the edge of sanity. With help from radio friends, he's about to embark on a global mission that would change the course of history as we know it. Broadcasting live from the secret studios on the banks of the Brandywine River in Delaware is Mitchell K.C. Hill. And up to the Great White North in Vancouver is Alexander Knight. Oh, yeah. This is uh, episode, I think it's four. Episode four? Are we up to four? I think so we're up, already. We're up to episode four. They haven't thrown us off yet. I know there's there's an attempt being made to throw us off the air, but it uh, hasn't happened quite yet. Hi and welcome. Uh, happy Easter to uh, those of you that celebrate uh, the holiday. If those of you don't, that's fine. Good to have you here either way. Do they celebrate Easter up in uh, Canada? I guess they do. They do. I mean, not everybody uh, celebrates that in the country, but uh, yeah, we absolutely do. Uh, I don't really observe it as a, as a religious holiday for me personally, but we still get together as a family. Uh, yeah, I, we've got some amazing cooks in our family. I don't know about you, Mitch, but uh, delicious ham and baked beans and all sorts of stuff. I had a ham, um, a ham lunch, courtesy of Wegmans. If, I don't know if you have any Wegmans in your area, but it's like a uh, a really cool grocery store. It also has a bakery and a a deli and all that kind of stuff. But anyhow. Welcome to The Last Angry DJ. My name is Mitchell Hill. I'm a uh, Last Angry DJ. I uh, also want to introduce my good friend, producer, and co-host, Mr. Alexander Knight. Hello. I really appreciate everybody joining us today because I know it is, you know, people are doing things. They've got, uh, they've got holiday plans. So the fact that we have, you know, a bunch of people here in, in the live stream it's amazing to me. I'm, I'm, I'm really honored we're a new show. Not a lot of people know about us yet, but uh, I really appreciate everyone being here. And, and you know, that's the crazy thing about building, uh, and that's literally what you do. Uh, you build an audience on a uh, podcast. So, you know, we don't care if there's 20 people or 30 or 40. How many people are subscribed? We've got eight watching right now and counting. Uh, we got 48 subscribers. So, you know, smash that subscribe button, you know, hey. You know, we're a long way from thousands, maybe millions of people. I don't think we'll ever get quite that far, but we're up for it if it uh, should happen. But uh, it's good to have you all here. Uh, we have a lot of our friends from uh, Office Hours uh, joining us today. It's great to have them there. I spent three years on Office Hours, and I learned a great deal from them. I'm not currently doing it so much as I did before, but uh, for now, uh, we welcome. There are great friends. There are people that are take their technical very, very seriously uh, I learned quite a bit from office hours in terms of uh, no pronouns, be a little more casual about uh, uh, how you speak and what you speak of and slow your voice down, mellow out a little bit. And um, it's a technical uh, oriented program. So we talk about microphones and cameras and lighting and how to make your uh, images look good. So it's really good, especially on today, World Breakup Day. Good to have you here. On the day uh, that's Mitch, uh, that's, breaking up. That's World Backup Day, just so you know. World Backup. Backup as in uh, I had a so, I had a whole thing yeah. I was going to do about breaking up is hard to do. So it's backup as in uh, beep, 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 beep. No, not you, that backup? No, not that kind. The, the data as in data in your computer going up to the cloud. You know, we have this thing called the cloud where data don't goes, use it. travels up there. But don't use it. Don't trust it. I'm not a cloud guy. I mean, some people are just like that. You know, it's it's hard to get me to, to, to do any of that stuff. Does that sound like we kind of set that that gag up? Have we got to the point where we're we're pulling a wool over our people? Let's, let's do something funny. I'm going to call it World Breakup Day. You know, well, you know, Maybe so it is a breakup. people are wondering what what do we do? We we do the show every single week. What do we do to fill up that entire time? And and the thing is, we're you and not you and I are too busy writing the script for the next show. So that's what it is. It, it may oh, the show script. Sometimes it may fall. I wonder flat. what those letters and flat, words but. going. <laughs> yeah, these letters are going by, Mitch, you ignorant idiot, you are supposed to... S okay, I get it. That's a teleprompter. That's when we read a, a screen. Like any TV show, you know, like the news even. If they're looking at you in the screen, just like this, like making eye contact, they're actually looking at a device that uh, scrolls past the uh, text that they're reading. So if you see them, you know, sh juddering while they're doing it, it's because they're having a hard time reading. I'm doing this all extemporaneously. So I can use big words like that. And if I saw the word extemporaneously on the screen, I would have to sound it out. It would be hard for me. 
But um, I learned a lot about, uh, or I actually, uh, let's say I sharpened my skills on office hours because I used to be what they called a reader, and I would read a lot of the questions and do that. It gave me some wonderful um, uh, abilities to do things that I didn't do before as a radio disc jockey. Uh, reading uh, from a teleprompter or just reading from a screen. And um, the toughest things about reading when you're you know, supposed to be an announcer type person is reading acronyms and reading ahead while you're uh, looking at the copy. So if you're reading a, a sentence that somebody you know, wrote uh, that you haven't read before, you're actually reading maybe you know, a couple of seconds in the future before it comes gets processed in your head and comes out your mouth. That's part of the talent of being uh, on the radio or on TV and stuff like that. So thank you, Office Hours, for uh, giving me that chance to do that for three hours. But um, a lot of questions have been bouncing around. This is the neat thing about starting a podcast, which is kind of a video. Can we call it a podcast or is it more of a video podcast? And is there is there such a thing? We do it live via video. Yeah. People have Sundays. opinions. People have very strong opinions. They say you should not call a YouTube show a podcast. And by definition, by technically it's not because a podcast by definition is an RSS feed, right? That's very, very old technology uh, that dates back to the, to the 90s with Dave Weiner. And so basically an RSS feed is essentially just a, a, a file with a bunch of XML in it and with links to MP3 files so you can play audio. So, and of course that became a standard and Apple uh, adopted that. And uh, that is what we use for podcasts. So uh, I guess you Are should you call that? YouTube a podcast. No, I'm just going by Are memory. you saying that right off the top of your head? Just, that just is right brilliant. off the top of my head here, right off. You are Mr. Tech. It's, and know, what's it's, RSS it's almost, stand I've, for? It's almost as if I've done a podcast before. So what was that, Mitch? What's RSS stand for? Really stupid scripting? I think it's re like real that? simple syndication or something similar to that. Uh, yeah. I think I got that. Wow. But, uh, Syndicate. Now we're syndicated. You know, everybody, it's Wonderful. one of those things where, where people just call YouTube shows a podcast, right? So I guess it's a podcast. It's fine. And everybody that has something to say does a podcast too. Now, here's the thing. Uh, you know, this is the last angry DJ. So we, you know, we, we talk about media, we talk about the music industry, we talk about radio, obviously. Um, just because we have something to say doesn't mean that we should be putting it out there. That's kind of where we are in the world now is that anybody like your uncle Bob, the crazy uncle Bob, uh, has something that he wants to say. And usually you only have to hear him once a year at Thanksgiving. Now you got to hear him every week on his podcast because, you know, Uncle Bob has something crazy to say. So the idea of bringing podcasts out there is interesting. The other thing is a lot of the early adopters of podcasting, or RSS as you call it, um, have survived to today. And some of them are making very serious money. Like um, Joe Rogan, I think he makes a, a ton of money doing it, and he does it for a living. Uh, Mr. Beast, Beast, is it? Roast Beast, what is his name? And um, uh, there's a uh, there's a huge number of people. I know that everybody has their favorites, but those are the ones that kind of jump up. And they have millions upon millions. I don't know how they got there. I mean, well, is it I, something that happens overnight? It's not It's not a simple answer. But, I mean, in those examples, let's just take Joe Rogan, for example. So when you have a, um, you know, when you have a comedian and, or an actor or any kind of celebrity, they already had an existing audience, right? They've already put the time and the work in to develop some kind of audience that is going to follow them no matter what platform they're going to be on. So I think that really helped Joe Rogan uh, out uh, quite a lot. I think if nobody knew him from news radio or from anything really, I, I don't think, I think he would have, I'm not saying he wouldn't have been successful, but I think he would have had a lot more challenges trying to get that show uh, up and running and trying to get that that show to the level where it's at now because he has a lot of connections too right he's got actor friends and all sorts of celebrity friends now so he can just he's got this giant rolodex where he can pull in all these incredible guests and of course you know he's quite divisive so a lot of people don't necessarily like all of his guests but uh mitch a lot of people don't make money from podcasts. I just want to stress that those people that you mentioned there's a tiny tiny percentage. I don't know exactly what that is but let's just call it the 1% because there's a majority of people that make zero, zero income. I, I mean, I'm still in the negative and I've been doing stuff 
for 13 years now. You know, I've I've tried to get donations from people and got a little bit of money there, but nothing. I wouldn't call any of the podcasts. You were I've a zygote when you started I've done doing hundreds podcasting? and hundreds of episodes, and none of them really made any money. I'm still in the negative. So I, I'm yeah. already calling JG Wentworth, and I said, I want I want my money now. But they said that's not the way it works. See, I'm I'm playing into the future when we make lots of money. <laughs> I'd like to have some of it now. <laughs> yeah, of you course, know, because we'll have. We'll have tens of hundreds of people watching this program. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? It'll be exciting. Um, one of the questions that came up uh, in our uh, little teaser keyframe is, what is this thing on your hat, Mitch? I'll, uh, does anybody know what that is? If you're on, uh, if you're on chat, go ahead and uh, identify it. You have to be an older person. Somebody who knows what a Rolodex is will probably know what this is also. So let's see who's the first to figure it out. Come on, I know James has got it. Guy might even know what that is. You know what that is? That thing? It's a thing. All right. All right. Guy Cochran, while we're waiting for that, Guy Cochran actually said that uh, he was asking, who is the second to last angry DJ? And I well, know you obviously like to, you are. You like to call me the second to last angry DJ. I'm not sure you're I, the, you're, how angry You're the runner-up, dude. You're the runner-up because you're be. you're a zygote. You're a, you're a young millennial zygote. So how can you possibly be the last angry DJ? You know, which? How many years have you been on the planet? Thirty some. Forty one. Wow, you still are a zygote even at that <laughs> age, for sure. All right, this thing. Uh, let's see. Did somebody get it? Who is W four RDM? I don't know who that. Whoever that is, W four RDM. Whoever you it. are, you win the hat. It's a forty five adapter. And if you were a DJ back in the early days, of you, the records came as an LP, a long playing record, 33 to 3rd, and, uh, unless it was an EP, in which case it could be an extended play. And a 45, which is slightly smaller, I guess that's 7-inch, uh, with a larger hole in the center. And you would place this little uh, plastic adapter in the center so it would fit on a spindle on a uh, turntable. Uh, that was. Uh, it, that's why you only had two speeds, 33 and a 3rd. And 45. Four, we're talking vinyl here, okay? <laughs> so we can explain what the heck, uh, put it in context. And I don't know why, but all the broadcast uh, 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 record players I ever used, um, and probably to this day, had a 78 position on it. And how many 78s did we play in the 70s? None. Zero. Zip. But they were there nonetheless. So it was either a 33 and a third and 45. And uh, if you're a radio person that spun records on the air or even at a club, uh, you know the horrible embarrassment of uh, leaving it in 33 and oh, playing no. a 45 at the wrong speed. <laughs> no, strange. Yeah, I've done I love my uh, turn. Yeah, it happened. I, I love my turntable, but I can't imagine. Uh, I've done, you know, I've done my, my share of uh, college radio, but I can't imagine how nerve wracking it must be to to be a DJ and have to queue up stuff on a vinyl record. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Howard Stern's movie Private Parts, but there's a hilarious scene where he's in the he's playing himself, young Howard Stern, and he's he's just fumbling with the records and he screws it up and the needle slips off the record and he's like freaking out. It's just hilarious. What was that like for you? Um, well, there was a lot of mechanical stuff that went on when you're on the air. And here's, here's what you would do. You literally were a disc jockey, although I like the term presenter, which the, uh, our English brothers and sisters uh, use. Presenter is a much you know, more uh, important name. But anyhow, uh, you would sit in a room, and you would have uh, at least two turntables, so you could segue between each one and the other. Segue means to play one song and then crossfade to it or bang in the next one at the end of the... A previous song, and uh, you'd be playing those records, but you also had to find the next record from the hot clock that you followed that was the format of the station. Oh, we're going to play a top five, we're going to play a uh, recurrent, we're going to play an oldie here, um, all the different positions on the clock, which we'll get into in another show. It's, it's a whole lot to carry here. Uh, so you'd be pull, finding the song that's next on the list, placing it on the turntable, and then queuing it up. And what that meant was that you had to back the record right to where the music starts and then turn it back maybe a quarter turn or a little differently depending 
how quickly your turntable can come up to speed so that when you bang the uh, the turntable, uh, the song would come up to speed without going, you don't want it to do the uh, up to speed. You want it to be right there. And when you had a fast-paced radio format on a top 40 station, um, they had to play a song. And yet if it had a cold ending on the song, which means it ends very abruptly, right. you have to be right there. So there were a couple of ways to do that. One is that your little head uh, could figure out that you had to hit it just slightly before it ended so you get the time. Or if you were playing a jingle uh, that was fast, and we had these things called shotgun jingles that lasted maybe one and a half seconds, um, that you had to have the jingle, music, jingle, music, 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 you know, things like that. Uh, and the timing and the technology that you had to, you had to play with uh, either made you a really tight disc jockey or a good disc jockey or um, one that uh, spent a lot of time with all the mechanics. So there's a couple of things you're doing. So you're playing 45s, uh, you're segueing them, or you're playing them. You have to pick them out. You have to know where it is on the uh, platter as it plays. Sometimes if there's a new song and you don't know how it ends, you're literally looking at the record on the platter, looking to see when this... Did I show my bald spot again? I apologize. My uh, hairline is a subject of conversation. Uh, nobody, nobody Anyhow, notices. It's just another thing that makes me angry. And nobody notices. Come on. Uh, so, you know, you had to look at the record to see exactly where it was on the turntable that was playing across. You had to make sure you had it at the right speed. And they had these things called carts. Um, why don't you talk just for a second? I'm going to grab one because I think we need to show sure. people what they are. So I'm going to jump off just for okay. a second. No, no problem. How much is doing that? You know, I wonder if Mitch ever broke a needle while he was on, on the radio. That's got to be. What do you do? If it's 19, circa 1972 and you're on the radio and you're about, you're queuing up a record and you see the needle snap, what the hell do you do when that happens? It's not like you when got a needle empty, snaps. I've never had a needle. You've never snap. had that happen. Surely that, that's happened to somebody, right? No, and don't call me Shirley. <laughs> so we had these things, uh, they're pieces of tape and a cartridge. It looks like an A track. Uh, but it's not. This is uh, literally a shout from one of my radio shows. And it's an endless loop tape. The tape is inside of here. And you place it in a machine like the so. You jam it in there. And uh, when you hit the start button, it played instantly and then recued to the uh, the beginning. So your show is pretty much made up of these things, your mouth, and uh, the 45 records that you're queuing up and playing. And on these things, you would have jingles. Uh, commercials, you can see at the time, mm -hmm. there's yeah, like 40 that, yeah. seconds and 70 seconds, the length of the time. So carts were a big, were a big deal. So I, I'm still answering a question. I, there's so many things that you had to do and you had to do it with a certain tempo and timing to make it a tight radio program. Um, and it, it really wears on your brain to be dealing with all these things, because if you've got maybe 10 to 15 songs per hour that you played. And maybe if you're on a top 40 station, it was successful. You were playing up to 20, 22 minutes of uh, commercials an hour. So you got to be looking for the right cart. And it was usually in a rack that spun around next to you. And one of the things that we used to do is if you got really excited and maybe a little nervous and you spun that rack trying to find the song or the uh, uh, the commercial on the other side and the rack falls over or all the cars go flying willy-nilly around the room, uh, that's a rookie error. And I've done it before. Uh, then you're really in trouble because you have to find time to uh, place all those uh, carts into the rack in the right place. And then you load them up on the cart machine, yeah. play the turntables. Uh, think about what you usually had about maybe 30 seconds before the song ended to think about what you're going to say in the next stop set or going into the next right. record. Stop so set. lots oh, of mechanical that, things, that lots of distractions, that. and you were a DJ. Now, today, all that's done been replaced by a computer. All you have to do is cycle, cycle. You know, what's next event, next event. Until it um, crashes. And I have, well, it can. Not I mean, that a lot it's of ever built, happened to me. Built not to have that happen. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah. If your computer crashes, and I've had it happen before, uh, you've got to engage the mouth and fix the problem while you're, well, of course, we weren't on camera, but uh, you had to fix the problem while you were uh, on the air. So um, it, it leads to a lot of, uh, I, you know, I haven't been on the radio regularly for a good 20 years, maybe even 30. Gosh, it's hard to keep track of all this. And um, I have a post-traumatic stress syndrome from it. I have dreams 
uh, where I can't find the next song, yeah. the record's yeah. ending, or it's skipping, and I'm at the other end of the building or in the bathroom. Mm. Uh, and um, it it still wears on me because that constant pressure of having that continuity. Yeah. So Mitch, uh, let me, today, not so much because it's automated. Let me, let me just bring in a question from the chat here. To uh, uh, We've got uh, Shoji Productions asking, Mitch, did you ever, uh, did you ever spin 45? LPs, or did just the full well, size? Uh, a a four LP would not be uh, a forty-five, but there were think uh, we would call them EPs, extended play, that uh, would have a song, maybe a larger or longer version of the song that was in the shape of a twelve-inch uh, record. Uh, yes, we played LPs those, long but played, mostly. Right? Well, EP was but LP stands for long play but right. mostly if you were playing a single song on a large format disc normally associated as an LP it would be called an EP so it might be a, a special mix it might be something that's extra long um you had to make sure you had the right speed because sometimes they were at 45 but mostly they were at 33 so to answer your question uh uh Robert uh yeah a lot of 45s tons of them stacks of them and uh, they were always uh, in the room with you, and you had to pull them off. In our case, we had them on pegs. There was a board with pegs, and you'd had the 45s for the, the top five, the top ten. We played the same song every hour sometimes, and sometimes more than once in an hour. Uh, so it was a very, uh, very high-pressure uh, gig. The only time it got a little bit easier was when I went to WFIL in Philadelphia uh, it was one of the handful of radio stations in the country that had engineers uh, or producers that sat in a room across from you, and they played all of the stuff. They they pulled the records. They played the commercials. They were concerned with uh, the continuity of the show, mixing the sound to get the sound right. Um, and you sat in a room with a microphone, and you could turn your – well, in this case, I could turn my mic on and off, and that was it. And I could cue the uh, the next event. Like if I was uh, reading a tag, I'd say this week only at all J.C. Whitney sh- stores, boom, and they would hit the next event. Um, that was a luxury in a sense, but it was also a really neat thing, um, not found in smaller markets, mostly in big markets uh, uh, like the guys at ABC, NBC, LS, KHJ, et cetera, back in the day. They probably all had engineers. And then when they went to what was called combo uh, it meant that the DJ did both jobs. But there was something very magical about having uh, an engineer in the studio with you. Um, I should have one of those engineers. I used to have an engineer named Joe Gallagher who went to work for Voice of America. Hey, Joe. Um, I should have him on as a guest uh, to tell the what the experience was like to spin the records and play the carts for the, uh, for the talent. Because it was a very, very neat uh, setup because you could concentrate on your content at that point. Plus, you were speaking to somebody who was sitting right in front of you, and they would re- react and respond uh, to what you were doing. So uh, it made for a very interesting program. So yeah, 45s, played them. Uh, had other people play them for me, which was uh, a real luxury and a really cool thing. And WFIL, um, I can play an air check someday of what I sounded like there, uh, had, the, uh, had just a, a really tight uh, very produced sound that was really because of the producer slash engineer that sat in the room uh, across from us and uh, sequenced everything uh, and made the show that so much better. I had one engineer, uh, Steve Drucker, that was the king of drop-ins. And drop-ins were sound effects. Like if you said something funny, you know, you might play like, wah, 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 you know, something like that, or uh, a cow mooing or a duck quacking. Remember the... Uh, Don Imus, it's 8.25, WABC uh, time. Quack, quack. Maybe the quack, quack would happen. Uh, I know, I, I'm sort of losing my mind. But they had all these little sound effects and gags that would uh, drop in. I was a drop-in king, too, by the way, Yeah, and you, I was on it. It, it. it sounds like, I mean, obviously you enjoyed your time in radio, even though you had some challenges. But uh, uh, are, do you feel nostalgic for those times at all? Do you Do you miss it? People are wondering about that. Oh yeah, yeah. I would, mm-hmm. I would pay you, if I could get into it? a one-time time machine uh, and go back in time. I would go back to my uh, first uh, uh, job in radio at WAMS here in Wilmington. I'm still in the same town. And what was uh, the, th- the thing that we had that we didn't even have in the big major market stations 
was we had a camaraderie of trying to get that next job. Everybody that worked there was a DJ who was trying to better themselves by getting a job at a bigger station. That was the, that was the uh, 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 the preoccupation of of a uh, disc jockey was I, I want to get that big job in Texas or uh, in Chicago or L.A. We all uh, went crazy for WFIL. That's the station we all wanted to work for. So through my whole career for the first six years, um, I would send what were called air checks to WFIL to one Jay Cook, who was the program director there. And we'd always get these uh, uh, very nice letters back from Jay Cook saying, uh, nice air check. Uh, we don't, we're not hiring at this time. Um, good luck to you in your career. We'll keep your stuff on file, yada, yada. And, you know, it was just a pleasure to have that piece of paper, which I don't have anymore, of uh, what it was like to get that. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was where I would like to go back to my early, even, even when I finally got to that station, WFIL. It was, it was great. But the thing about a station like that, uh, it is so professional, so big, so influential, and so much of a career maker or breaker that um, you had to concentrate on your uh, presentation. There wasn't a lot of chit-chatting going on between uh, the jocks. There wasn't so much of a, uh, a band of brothers as much as there were in the small markets where we were all working trying to uh, – as, as – uh, my good friend, uh, uh, my good friend who I can't remember right, Joel Denver used to say, uh, "You do your four and hit the door." That was basically it. You know, you didn't hang around, you didn't socialize, you just did your shot job, and that was it. Right. Uh, so, uh, going back to the days where we just loved the radio to the extent we would we would eat, drink, and celebrate it. We would talk about what stations were doing in other parts of the country. We would talk about even the stations in Canada, the big CKLWs. Uh, Buffalo, New York, WKBW. Uh, we could hear all these stations at night because of certain atmospheric conditions that existed called skip that allowed us to, uh, it was, that was before um, social media. So in a sense, radio was right. kind of a social media. It was kind of neat. Did you ever try out, and I'm going somewhere with this, but did you ever try out to be the weather guy? Because, and the reason why I asked for that is because I, I, I didn't really understand how hard that job is until I actually tried to do it. I, I went for an audition uh, to do it, and they just gave me five minutes of training, basically saying, "Well, you know, you this is where you pull the data from for tra uh, sorry, not did I say weather guy? I meant traffic, traffic report stuff." And it was just utterly nerve wracking. I had five minutes of training. And then he basically said, you, you got 10 minutes to record this demo, and then we'll, we're going to be making decisions on whether or not we're going to hire you or somebody else. And I just remember it, I got to the end of the – I went to the end of the 10 minutes, and I wasn't done. And it was just completely nerve-wracking. I don't understand how anybody can do that job. I just walked out, and I just said, see ya. This isn't for me. Bye. Couldn't do it. Absolutely could not do it. Uh, I don't know how anybody looks at that th those maps and reports on traffic with such an authoritative – matter like i just don't understand how they do that so i have great respect for people that can do that and make it sound so fluid i i can't do it well it's it comes from iteration i mean if you do it enough you're going to get really good at it whether it's traffic or weather or sports sports was real hard on me um i couldn't i couldn't pronounce half the teams i remember the first time i saw duquesne uh spelled out a uh, duquesne or something like that. I was having a hard time with it. I, and I don't know anything about sports. I'm just one of those few people that don't don't yeah. know it. But uh, for weather or for traffic, uh, essentially you're, you're disseminating information that people uh, need uh, and want it quickly without too many embellishments. So it's hard as a fun, loving, you know, uh, edgy personality on the radio uh, to present uh, something that people don't really want it done in that style. But the backup I had as a, uh, a new young disc jockey, very green, uh, doing the weather is if I screwed up, then that became part of the entertainment. So I was say, hey, it'll be partly cloudy today. It, it'll be dark tonight, light tomorrow, the continuing trend until the sun goes supernova or, you know, whatever we were doing. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I feel your pain. It would be hard to hit the broadcasting business cold by having to do things that are very uh, uh, very technical in nature, like weather or news, being a newscaster. I was never a newscaster. I couldn't do that. 
there were people that were really great at it. Um, uh, you know, quick side story. Um, I did a uh, stint for three months because I couldn't last much longer than that because of the music we played. But uh, at WPEN in Philadelphia, uh, went oldies uh, for oldies format. We're talking like the 50s stuff, you know, the doo wop stuff. I was 17 years old when I got hired there and 18 when I got on the air there. Um, and we played this just horrible music for me because I, all I wanted to do was end up working at uh, WFIL at some point. And uh, what happened was, is that I would, uh, uh, I would, I would, I would sort of bite the bullet. I was doing afternoon drive. It was my first major market gig, uh, working at that's WPEN. A, that's a big deal, right? It, it was a very big deal. But the problem was, they wouldn't tell me what the format was. They just said we're starting a new station. They were dark when I went to the uh, went to the radio station. So uh, I went to work for Julian Breen at WPEN, and uh, the smartest thing that I ever did was to bring my newsman from uh, WAMS, back in WAMS, back in Wilmington, um, to come on board. His name was Bruce Smallwood. And one of the things that we had when we went to PEN is we all had middle names for some strange reasons. So he became Bruce Eric Smallwood. And uh, I was Bobby uh, Dashboard Dark. This all lasted for about three months. And uh, the news guy, Bruce, was the funniest person I ever knew. He could crack me up no matter what I was trying to do or how serious I was going to be. We, we have some serious moments with the mayor of uh, Philadelphia would be there and, and I'd be introducing uh, the news and we'd do these old news teasers. So I'd be like, hey, that was uh, 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 Walter Brennan and Old Man River. And here's, uh, here's what's coming up in the news. And Bruce would come on and say at the time they were, uh, the, the, the government was cutting back some of the uh, support for some of the uh, – uh, some of the uh, 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 military bases. And so he came, and there was this base called Fort Dix in Philadelphia, or, uh, in New Jersey. So uh, I introduced uh, Bruce, and he came on and said, Uncle Sam cuts dicks off. News next. And it just completely flattened me. Uh, it was a legitimate read. It, there wasn't anything. It was double, double entendre, obviously. But it just completely wiped me out, and I started laughing. I was, like, reaching up to the console to try to hit the next uh, sequence. Uh, and Bruce is laughing. I'm laughing. The entire Philadelphia that was listening to the station was laughing. And I'll, I'll never, ever forget that. So having a newsman right. that was just as entertaining uh, as anything that you would say. You know, he, he referred to uh, thunderstorms as thunder bummers. And we shall have thunder bummers uh, coming into the area. And tonight it'll be cold enough to freeze your asparagus. That was the way he talked. He's passed on since then, but uh, he was a great guy, great newscaster, and I could never have done that. That was just uniquely Bruce Eric Smallwood's uh, right. gig on you know, the radio. I, I've heard other DJs on the radio, not now, because radio now is boring, and I, I, I wonder yeah, what's happened to that. Because there used to be so much more humor, so much more edginess. Let's just, let's just dance on the edge and see what we can get away with. And you don't really hear a lot of that as much anymore. At least I don't. I mean, in Vancouver, I, I, I'll just periodically change the radio station. I, like, where are the personalities? Well, it evolved, it evolved away from uh, personalities. I think that uh, uh, as the business became more uh, uh, cookie cutter across the countries, uh, Canada and the U.S., and I think everybody pretty much followed suit everywhere. Um, the the national program director or the people that were running the big companies like iHeart or Clear Channel back in the day, um, they would want a lot of control over what was said and how it was said, and the, uh, the music was played a certain way. So there were so many conditions upon how you should present uh, as a, a personality that it kind of like took it away uh, because they felt that, um, and this was something that got drilled into my head, is that the DJ or the announcer can do more to harm the sequence of events than help it. And what that means is you're more likely to say something that's going to irritate people, or you may not be so funny as you think you are, and they're really there to hear the music. So let the music speak for itself. Uh, don't get in the way of the music. So keep the keep the tempo going. So uh, I, I think it kind of evolved away from 
allowing uh, the personalities to get involved. Now, certainly there are some exceptions to that rule. There were some personalities that maintained, uh, you know, in, in certain markets. Obviously, Howard Stern is an example. He was a shock jock. But there were a lot of morning zoos all over the country uh, where they had uh, a team of people presenting uh, all kinds of stuff. And uh, morning shows were uh, a, a kind of a genre into themselves. So it wasn't so much of the music being played right. as the uh, the content. But um, I, sadly, uh, the, and that's one of the reasons why I guess I'm angry, uh, I was cut in the mold of be a little edgy, be funny, make right. fun of things, uh, play the music, uh, enjoy yourself, uh, do crazy bits. You well, know, and um, what was that? Ter- can you explain that term? What was that term you used? Zoo? Something zoo show morning zoo yeah morning zoo what is what is that um it was a term mean? I don't know which which market started it but uh, Scott Shannon comes to mind uh, there were a number of I mean every big market had a zoo uh, show and essentially it was it was sort of saying that uh, there's a group of people here and they're all here to entertain you they're monkeys essentially that are liable to say anything but they really play off of each other real well so it sounds like a zoo. You know, you got giraffes and monkeys and hippos and lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Uh, so that was just one of the terms that sort of got uh, coined for broadcast. And here's one thing you can be sure of in the broadcast world. If you find something that works in one market uh, within a very short period of time, everybody and every market's going to be trying to do the same thing. So there was probably a race in each market to see who's going to be the first morning zoo in Chicago or, you know, in uh, Lick Skillet, Alabama, or Dull Arrow, uh, Nebraska, whatever, wherever it is, with all due respect to all those areas. So it was a, uh, it was a fad that to kind of ran its, uh, ran its thing. But you know, shock jocks like Howard Stern, they had their fad time too. But then they sort of, you know, fell out of uh, favor. And um, it well, I don't know about safer. that. I mean, Howard Stern has a pretty big audience still on on. Uh, he's not on terrestrial, but he's on. Sirius XM, and he still has a lot of a lot of people's pay for Sirius just to hear him. And he's a, certainly, as a human being, because we all evolve. We're not the same person we were 30 years ago. He's evolved as, as an interviewer. I I think he's actually better now than he ever has been, as far as just an interviewer goes. Is he's he's not trying to get in edgewise. He genuinely tries to just listen. And be interested in that person and be curious, which I think curiosity makes a good interviewer. And he's much better. If you go back and look at anything he did 25, 30 years ago, it was just like he was just tr- constantly interrupting people, constantly just trying to get any any kind of salacious information out of them. And he doesn't really do that anymore. Well, he does it, but he doesn't. Uh I, I agree with you. I, your assertion, I think, is correct. I think Howard sort of mellowed with age and became more uh, uh, of a skilled uh, interviewer. He knows a lot of Hollywood people. He knows a lot of people in the music industry. If you want to see how far Howard has come as far as an interviewer goes, um, look on HBO. He did uh, uh, an interview with Bruce Springsteen, which was brilliant. It was really well done. Absolutely. Uh, he speaks on a very human level. Um, it wasn't all about, you know, let's see if we can get some bikini-clad women to come in so we could do something salacious like he's – salacious? Salacious? Salacious. I'm sorry. There you go. Salacious. Something delicious. Uh, anyhow, uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. I think he, he has certainly moved in, a, in that direction because the, the, the irony is is all of that crazy morning zoo humor uh, gets old after a while. It gets uh, redundant and dependable and, you know – making fun of people can get a little tiresome after a while. It was kind of cool in the beginning because he was like breaking a lot of rules. He was on terrestrial broadcast. He was fighting the management at stations like WNBC. He had a, a, I think he had a general manager. He called pig vomit and he broke into the general manager's office and he got thrown off the air live. He had a live mic and it was just kind of a, a, a soap opera. Uh, and uh, played bro- I, I just want to say played absolutely brilliantly in the in the Howard Stern Private Parts movie by Paul Giamatti. I mean, he was just I, I don't know what the original pig vomit was like, but that character, that role that he did, and he to this day even Paul Giamatti credits Howard Stern for like that movie really changed his career. And he's if you watch that movie right up until the end of the 
credits too. There's a little bonus scene where, where he's because he was fired from that station. He's like, I'm managing a mall now. <laughs> WNBC. WNBC. That was the, the NBC. NBC. No, no, no. L- listen to me more, Kevin. WNBC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that whole that whole bit. Paul Giamatti is a brilliant actor. I loved him in Billions, by the way. He was uh, absolutely the best. Uh, I guess they're still going, and um, the the whole private parts. There's a there's a little side of me that's a little bit jealous of Howard uh, because I was trying to do kind of shock jockey things way before Howard got popular doing it. I think I was experimenting with it. Had I stayed in radio, I might have gone there a little bit more and might have had success with it. Maybe not. A lot of what you do in the broadcast business is sheer luck. You know, having talent is a prerequisite. You have to be good at what you do. And you just happen to have to be in the right place at the right time uh, before your uh, your big break comes along. And then when it happens, seize it and make something of it. I, I regret that my days at WFIL where I had reached the what I consider to be the epitome of, there's that word again, of, uh, of being on the air, uh, I regret that I didn't take more advantage of it. I don't think that I took it serious enough to leverage uh, that opportunity. I was too young and probably too green to know how to deal with that kind of success at a very young age. I was all of about 18 or 19 years old when I was on the air. And and just to put this all into perspective, let me do this just for a second. This is, this is me when I first started in radio uh, in 1972. That's me with hair. Uh, I was Bobby Dark at WAMS, and look at the songs that were being played. I can see clearly now Johnny Nash was the number one song. So that'll give you an idea of uh, how far back I go for uh, for broadcast. Yeah, I had hair back then. It was uh, all over my face, and I was about 100 pounds so, uh, lighter. You had some Alice Cooper on there, too. Electa, that's a great song. Yeah, hey, one of the neat things about music back then was uh, Top 40 – had extremes for whatever reason uh, that uh, played back to back. Like yeah, there's a Helen Reddy song in there, which meant you could play Helen Reddy and I Am Woman right back to Stairway to Heaven. Right. Back to back. Mata Hoople. It. There is I Am Woman. Mata Hoople. Mata Hoople. That's a great, a great rock edgy band. Uh, pre punk uh, uh, Mata Hoople. Yeah. Uh, Mel and Tim, Elvis even is in there, Cashman and West. Uh, the variety of music uh, that was played. Uh, on the uh, on the radio back in the top forty days, I just have to keep doing that because it looks cool. Uh, on the top forty days uh, was uh, very very uh, broad. Today it's not quite so uh, broad mm-hmm. in terms of uh, presentation because uh, there are so many choices. If you like Helen Reddy, then there's a station just for you that plays too much Helen Reddy and too well, much that's choice, the thing, isn't it? That yeah. where we had four or five stations in each market that would play. Most of the music that you got exposed to nowadays, whatever you like, you want punk country, you got it. It's probably out there somewhere right. on some station. And if you don't like the, uh, uh, you know, the stations uh, on Sirius XM or uh, on your uh, iTunes or whatever, uh, you can uh, you can create your own format, your own uh, playlist. But I guarantee you're going to be bored to tears after because it's predictable. It's predictable, predictably, predictably, the same songs that you like hearing day in and day right. out, it, just just like that one after the other. And that actually reminds me, and you know, this this came up, this question came up this morning, and I wanted to get your thoughts on this, Mitch. I kind of wanted to carry on the conversation that I had this morning in office hours. So somebody asked about the decline in podcast revenue. We've seen some podcasters talk about how just the ad revenue just isn't there as much anymore. And uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. I have my own theories about that. You know, in the first episode with Steve Stryker, we talked about uh, terrestrial radio and how, you know, one of the things he brought up, which I thought was uh, a salient point, was about the diversification of ad spends is that where they're not spending money on ad uh, on ads on radio as much as they did in the past because now there's so many different places where you can advertise, right? And not just in an audio format, but uh, hyper-local ads on Facebook. You have social media now, Facebook, Twitter. You can do very targeted advertising, and you've got YouTube, and you've got all these other platforms. But why do you think podcasts have declined with respect to ad revenue? 
Uh, because there's too many choices. I mean, it, it's very hard um, to have. I mean, how many podcasts are there? If somebody could really calculate. It's like half a million. How many? Yeah. I mean, are there half a million radio stations? No. Um, in, in one market where, where you're listening, maybe there's five or ten or something like that. So uh, clearly it's gotten to a point where uh, you can listen to whatever you want, whenever, whenever you want to. But uh, things are so scattered uh, as far as an audience goes, it's what what I like to refer to as narrow casting, not broadcasting. I didn't go into phrase. Somebody said it somewhere. And uh, because of that, uh, it's very hard. Well, it's very easy to target your ad dollars, but you don't have to throw it out there like they used to by buying uh, schedules on major market radio stations or networks or TV shows. You can reach people directly even by zip code. Uh, I think Google AdWords, it's Google Ads now. Uh, can be scheduled to reach people that have an interest in your particular product or service right down to the um, the zip code. So you could do it by streets. You couldn't do that in the uh, the old radio days or TV days because that was all based on your uh, market ADI, which was your full coverage area. So if I wanted to run an ad for a store in Wilmington, Delaware, where I am, um, and I wanted to go into a TV station, I'd have to buy TV time on a uh, Philadelphia station, which reach, reaches up to 8 million people in the ADI, which includes Philadelphia, uh, parts of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, maybe even Maryland. And uh, you're paying for an audience that goes way beyond your uh, intended coverage, but you have to pay for it. Uh, those days are gone. So I think what's happened is that if things are getting a lot tighter. I think the, uh, uh, the newness of podcasts is starting to wear a little bit thin, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was it was inevitable that people were going to start shuttering their podcasts because the money wasn't there. I mean, I don't think we went into this, uh, uh, Alexander, in order to make money. We did it to uh, keep ourselves off the streets uh, on Sundays, anyhow. Keep us uh, out of trouble. Something that was yeah, it's to keep us out of trouble. Out of but, trouble. Uh, yeah, we do this out of a labor of love. I mean, like I said at the the top of the hour, I've I've done hundreds and hundreds of episodes of podcasts none of them really made any money and that's just a reality and you know if they're i don't know the exact number but i remember looking at this data a couple of years ago they were nearly half a million podcasts or something similar astronomical number but also a giant chunk of those are just inactive shows or just shows that that ended as well and so it's really interesting. There's, um, I forget the name of the company, so I apologize I can't give them credit, but they did a really excellent deep dive report where they pulled all of this data from the Apple podcast directory and they found one really interesting thing and there was one magic number, okay? One magic number, 13 episodes. 13 episodes was the average number where people gave up on doing their podcast. Isn't that interesting? Oh, I can't wait. Because they realize it's a lot harder. It's hard to show up consistently every single week to create co compelling content, to make it good, just like the production values, right? You got to spend money to actually make this look and sound good. So people realize it's a lot harder. And you can't, if you want to build an audience, you can't just, um, you know, I don't feel like it this week. I'm going to take a month off or take two months off and I'll come back to it. The audience isn't going to be there. Okay, they they want they want to know that you're going to be there for them, so you've got to make the effort. Yeah, and we're we're narrow casting to a certain degree. We're trying to reach people that have an interest in broadcasting radio, uh, maybe uh, uh, some uh, authentic radio back in the day that leads back to the golden era, as we call it, uh, right up to today. And there's a lot of uh, uh, contrast between the way it was done back then and the way things are being done now. That's one of the reasons why I'm the last angry DJ, because obviously I was associated with broadcasting uh, at a time when it had a lot more cachet than right. it does today. Um, there's uh, a well, little bit on. of I, self I just got to stop you for a second, though. Did, I, did you actually do some kind of survey? How do you know you're the last angry DJ? Well, you... it's my opinion. So oh, my, that's okay. the thing about oh, podcasting. Here we go. That's what And it it's on the Internet. It doesn't and have to be truth, true. It just happens. <laughs> And now, and now, now the truth, and now the truth surfaces. Actually, the way it happened was, um, I was sort of floating the idea of doing a podcast. I didn't really want to do one, and I, and I've kind of held off on doing this for for years, because I see a lot of people that I know in the business 
that have gone on from radio to do podcasting. And I've watched them with interest to see, well, what are they contributing to the overall, overall zeitgeist of broadcasting and podcasting? And um, I didn't see a lot of interesting stuff coming out of it. It's like, oh, okay, I've heard that before. And it didn't seem like it was fun. Um, the promise that I made when I started floating the idea of doing this was um, I got to do something a little bit different. Maybe raise the, uh, uh, excuse me, open the kimono a little bit about what was going uh, on behind to, the scenes. You had to make it gross again. I did, it's nothing gross. If I have a kimono on, it looks great. You got, you got underwear under there? there or... See, now we're going to get into tidy whities or boxer shorts. I'm, I'm, I'm into the tidy whities. Sorry that I put that visual in your head. But anyhow, the point I'm making is that it, we had to be contributing something, something, something to the, uh, uh, the conversation about what it was like. Because I think people are curious. What was it like to be a DJ back in the day? So I put it out there that I wanted to do it. And um, my good friend, uh, Tommy Shustak, we call him Too Tall Tommy, uh, said, oh, the last angry DJ. And I just, I said, man, that's, that, that's a name. I think I like that. Because I figured people would look at it and say, okay, if he thinks he's the last angry DJ, why is he the last angry DJ? So sort of begs the question. So maybe maybe the the name suggests the content uh, sort of makes a promise that maybe this guy is angry. What, what could he possibly be angry about? And I'm, it, technically, I'm not really angry about anything, but I do yeah, have sure. some— Well, you're— uh, Sometimes. But the other part that was fun about the, I, I'm sorry, I got to finish the story here, uh, is that uh, we started doing it by not being angry, but pointing out the differences between what it was like then and what it's like now. And it extends into uh, my life in general. I'm 69 years old. I'm definitely a boomer. I'm not a millennial. I have a huge uh, 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 problem trying to connect with millennials today because I just don't have the same cultural references as, as uh, you millennials do. Uh, and you don't have them with mine either. So I'm trying to bridge the gap there because there's not many uh, opportunities to have a, a reasonable dialogue about all these things. And I, then I got to thinking, well, if I'm going to be representing the, uh, the older guys, I've got to have a younger guy too. And thankfully you raised your hand and said, I'll do it with you. So now not only do I have a producer, but I've got a technical guy and I have Alexander Knight who's here uh, as uh, a representative of millennials and younger people that are providing a little bit of the uh, the continuity between, you know, what it was like when I was older and what it's like now. Yeah. And maybe you are uh, the second uh, most angry DJ because you're dealing with a whole different world mm -hmm. than I am. Yeah, I mean, I would say that... Uh... I would say that I'm a bit of a curm not a bit, but quite a bit of a curm curmudgeon at times. I mean, I'm constantly complaining about things. I, I, just to give you an example, I, I took some coworkers out after work, rounded the troops up, and we uh, we went for drinks. And we don't do that that often. And uh, you know, I just do that once in a while, just to get get uh, to know people a little bit better. And uh, so I go to order a beer, and we have this deal with the brewery next door to us. To, to where we are, where we, because uh, we're, we're sponsoring the, these music nights that they do. And they give us, in turn, they give us a nice discount on drinks. And uh, I, I go, first thing I do is I order a pitcher of beer and the server goes, oh, we don't do it at, we don't do that anymore. I'm like, what do you mean you don't do that anymore? We just don't, we don't do that. I'm like, did you is it like take a wine all the, you have you, to try different? Well, I, I asked, I said, did you take all the pitchers? And just take them out back and crush them. What did you do with all the glass? They're like, I don't, I, I don't know. Then I ordered another, I ordered a drink. I said, okay, I'll just get a light beer. What's what's an easy to drink light beer that you would recommend? Well, actually, we have uh, we have three beers, but two of them are sold out. So I guess I'm taking. I don't really have a choice here, do I? <laughs> I don't think they liked me very much after that. I, I didn't know that uh, beer was a sport uh, sporting event, but apparently it is. I, I'm not much of a drinker. I used to be a drinker in the 80s. I don't do it so much anymore. But uh, I go to these places and they'll have a, a wine tasting thing or, you know, a, a wine pairing. You know, these are all, all very pretentious names to me. And I, I'm like the Larry David of the area where I live. So they say, pairing, how would you pair this with a McDonald's hamburger? And they literally, they would answer me, oh, I would go with a, uh, a burgundy with that uh, fine uh, Cabernet 
or something. And it, it, all this stuff t- strikes me as being somewhat pretentious. So maybe uh, beer, which is getting to be very, very popular. By the way, we have a couple of breweries. And probably have more breweries per capita here in Delaware than anywhere else. Uh, it's like we have dogfish heads mm-hmm. uh, sort of uh, got really, really big, really, really fast with all kinds of different uh, variations on a thing. Well, I can taste the fine hops, and maybe there's a whiff of seaweed in there, and so it's... Well, what else do you guys have to do in Delaware but brew beer, right? I mean, there's nothing else really going on. See, you can take a shot like that. You know, you (laughs) live in Canada. I couldn't resist. (laughs) Be ready because, uh, you know, Paybacks and Mitch. We got beer. Yeah, I know yeah. you do. Yeah. You also have maple syrup, and yes, uh, we do. you wear yeah. golden yeah. toques on your head, and yeah. uh, you say A. And uh, so we're gonna don't start this battle because it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a north south. I don't here's say the a. thing. Some people say A. I mean, I say A very, very rarely do I say A. Okay, that's okay. Yeah, we're just it's doing okay this podcast. Eh? Oh yeah, got some people in the but chat. But you know, room, well, you know what's yeah. great, and you kind of asked the question earlier, is the fact that you and I get along. Uh, there's mm-hmm. a mutual respect. Uh, we both have things in common that are touch points. We both like music. Uh, we both like technology. Uh, we both like presentation on uh, these kind of calls. We we insist on great sound, which we have. We're nerds. We insist on you great can say pictures. It. It's okay. Yeah, we're techie nerds. We're we're definitely into that. But we have touch points that that relate. So we always have something we can talk about. And what's unique about that is in this world, and I've said it before, I'll say it again, that you can't begin a conversation with people on the street or people you don't know or socially without running into some giant brick wall, which could be politics or religion or something else. We can't have free rolling conversations anymore. Um, So maybe that's one of the refreshing things about this program is that it's a wide open genre of conversation points that we can hit. And uh, you're going to get... Interesting opinions, by the way, I'll admit their opinions and uh, some of the things that I'm saying about broadcasting may be vehemently opposed by certain uh, people in the broadcasting industry, but I want to keep it real. And what that means is if somebody has a question about, really, do radio stations really play requests when we call on that request <laughs> line or go online? What's the, w- and the answer to that, what's the answer to, the answer that? to that is, no, we don't play requests. It may be a happy coincidence that the song you just asked for is coming up into rotation, but we spend so much time programming our station to play a certain uh, order of songs in a certain cadence uh, with certain separations and yada, yada. There's all kinds of the scientific stuff on that. We're not going to let some Joe calling or, or Josephine call in on the phone line and tell us what to play, but we want you to think you can. So that's one of the, the greatest uh, misconceptions of our broadcasting is that request line. Call now, 764-5300. Gosh, that's the same. What? That's the hit line for WAMS. Why do that, though? Why, why prompt that um, from people if this you're not is going before, to fulfill any, you know? To make a connection with your audience, to let them know that they have some say over what gets played. Um What's the biggest thrill in the world that you do request a song and it gets played? I said, I did that, that you had some control over that. Not so much anymore, but back then, that was a big deal. If uh, if you got on the air, uh, they they interviewed you briefly. As, right. at, hey, where are you calling it's, from? I'm calling from Norristown. Hey, what's going on there? Well, we just had a, uh, a street battle between two hockey teams and... A uh, guy got a uh, stick broken over his head. Hey, that's great. Well, good good talking to you. Another one bites the dust from Queen. Here you go. Here's your request. <laughs> you know, that, that's the kind of stuff that we would do that would just be, you know, kind of interesting and fun. One of the one of the fun things that, uh, that occasionally happens when you're an old guy like I've become is um, we were doing a promotion at one of the Harley-Davidson dealerships that I consult with. And um, his name is uh, Andre. Oh, God. Gardner. Sorry, Andre. Sorry about that. And Andre is probably the top DJ in Philadelphia radio, WMGK. I'd love to have him on sometime. And uh, Andre used to listen to all kinds of radio, even even had a radio station in his home uh, where he used to broadcast to, you know, the, the 200 feet around his house. But he was definitely into it. His, I think his brother or dad was uh, a famous disc jockey also. And he was one of those people that just embraced the whole idea of being on radio. And uh, I was shocked when I mentioned my name and he, he said, oh yeah, you're uh, you were on WFIL. 
And I'm like, yeah, how do you remember that? That was 50 mm. years ago. Wow. And, uh, yeah, he used to listen to me on a regular basis. And not only that, but he had some air checks, which are basically recordings of what I sounded like on the air at the time, which I was interested in hearing because I don't have any of my old air checks. I don't know. They all just disappeared or they evaporated. So what the point I'm trying to make is that uh, – some people still remember what it was like, and they worked towards that goal. And now Andre's a uh, big-time radio guy in Philadelphia, and very natural. His presentation is completely different than mine, but he's an aficionado of the uh, aficionado, anado. I, I'm see, I gotta, I gotta stop this. I can't throw these words out uh, of the Beatles. He knows everything about the Beatles. He has a syndicated show on the Beatles. Mm-hmm. He knows every tiny little tidbit of knowledge. Uh, about the Beatles. So Andre Gardner from WMGK, I'm going to put you on my list of uh, people to contact to have him on. I I would love to have him on uh, to talk about uh, somebody that's grown up with radio like you have, uh, Alex, and uh, and now is doing it. I mean, is is now a a, a going concern. I I just want to say uh, just for a a moment, uh, because, you know, we've we've got more and more people uh, watching the live stream. Uh, I just wanted to say hi to John Pareto in the chat room. And I just wanted to say to everyone, because, you know, you really kind of blew my mind that, you you know, going back to the thing you said about, well, we never really cater to people's demands where we would ask people to call in the radio station. I just want to say, because you've, sh- you've shattered my existence as a, as a listener, that 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 you guys just flat out flat out create an entire fabrication just like we're not gonna and i just want to say to our audience to the people <laughs> listening to the podcast that this show we're building trust here we're not going to do that we're not going to do that to you um yeah well we're going to keep it real that part of that means that uh if something happens that wasn't planned we're going to call attention to it and say okay um people have suggestions where they want to want us to do something or answer a question, we encourage you to uh, interact with us. Uh, you can't interact on a podcast, but you can on our live broadcast. One of the reasons why we do it. And the other thing I'm very curious about, I know who some of these people are, but uh, some of these great uh, nicknames that they've come up with them for themselves, uh, Nerd World Podcast, uh, call, Beauty Bubble. What is a beauty bubble? Uh, it might be somebody I know, but I'm loving all these names uh, in the chat. And I, I know I'm I'm commenting about things that uh, people do all the time with podcasts, but this is all new to me. So getting this uh, interaction, we didn't get this kind of interaction back in the old radio days. You know, we got the request line and that would ring and it would ring and it would, it would constantly be ringing, but they would all right. say, Hey, will you play Ben by Michael Jackson, man? And I, okay, we'll get it on as soon as we can. That was the answer. They'd say, uh, can you play seasons in the sun by Terry Jacks? Yeah, sure. We'll get it on in a minute. When? In a, in a few minutes. <laughs> when? Exactly. Uh, uh, half an hour from now. Uh, what What exactly did it say? We're never going to play Seasons in the Sun. Get it into your head. And uh, then we could hang up on him. I can't quite do it that way. Yeah, it's, we had, we it's had weird because, altercations. you know, when, when you're on the radio, it, it must feel like, you know people are, listen, you, you have an audience. They tell you, the people higher up tell you there's an audience. But unless people are calling in, you don't. It's it's a totally different experience, and it's a much more interactive experience now with podcasts or uh, anything to do with video, even on YouTube. And the way people do modern production now, and it's actually one of the things that I want to do with with our show here is uh, I want to incorporate you not just call people out, but actually I want to incorporate graphically. I, I want people to see themselves come in, in into the in, into the show in video format from the chat. So I'm, I'm going to look into ways of doing that because I think that's really important. I want people to feel like they're a part of the show. I'm sure you do too, Mitch. You want people to feel like they, you know, that what they have to say is is interesting, and and uh, we appreciate everybody's uh, feedback on the show. And actually, on that note too, I don't know if you want to talk about this. But we, we've been talking a lot about radio and talking about old music and Mitch I know you you some sort of wax poetic about the old days of the ver- the variety of music and what was on there and it's not the same now and uh what are your musical tastes do you want to share that with anybody what do you wow, listen what do you listen a, that's to that's a tough what do you like it's a tough question um I'm all over the place uh maybe it's because of my radio background uh I was a music director uh at WFIL I uh I assumed the reins of that job from Joel Denver who's 
much more talented than I am uh, when it comes to music. In fact, Joel went on to be uh, the the uh, the cre- creator of All Access uh, Music, which was a survey system um, including Media Base and. Anyhow, he, he, he was the curator of the, uh, the uh, most radio stations a- across the country. Uh, my personal tastes uh, are all over the place. Um, I can tell you what I don't like. I don't like doo-wop music, um, and I don't like a lot of current uh, uh, current stuff. Uh, it just doesn't it doesn't strike me as being. Um, it did, I don't it, if I don't hear a hook in the song, meaning something that's very repeatable, very memorable. Um, that's something that's missing from today's music. So I don't like that. Um, I don't like negativity. Um, I don't like music that um, denigrates a certain segment of our society or romances money or uh, how many women they can date because of their, uh, it, that, it just turns me off. So that's my personal opinion. As far as specific artists that I like um, all over the place, but I kind of grew up listening to music that my brother played in his uh, adjoining bedroom. He was like totally into uh, Sly and the Family Stone and funk. Uh, so f- somehow, I guess I, I looked up to my big brother and said, oh, he, he, that's, that, I know that. Uh, you can make it if you try. Uh, thank you for letting me be my, myself again. Uh, I kind of got into that. And so that stays with me. I like uh, uh, Parliament. Uh, I like uh, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire is one of my favorite. The, my my favorite mellow song is "That's the Way of the World" by Earth, Wind, and Fire. Uh, I hate "Color My World" by Chicago. Uh, probably the number one requested song of all time, uh, <laughs> mainly because I played it so much. And even though it's two minutes and thirty seconds long, and I know that um, that I just don't want to hear it one more time. And yet there were other songs that uh, that we played. Uh, over and over and over again that I still like listening to to this day uh, that I, I still think they're wonderful to hear. Uh, anything from Chicago, uh, some blood, sweat, and tears. Um, my personal favorites, uh, uh, Steely Dan, what's not to like, Donald Fagan. Uh, the IGY album is my favorite album of all time. I've got pretty eclectic tastes at all over. Uh, sort of got into jazz a little bit, uh, rhythmic jazz, Um a little bit of Latin flavor to it, uh, sort of. Uh, I have a friend uh, who's a chiropractor. His name is Bill Irby. Sort of turned me on to uh, jazz and different kinds of jazz, uh, mellow jazz, rhythmic jazz. There's so many different variations of it. Any favorite uh, jazz artists? It took me a while to um, to really to to get into jazz. I didn't like it. I, I I actually really really disliked it when I was younger in my twenties. I I was mostly listening to rock hard rock and heavy metal and it wasn't until my 30s where i started really diversifying a lot of the the musical genres but i'll I'll let you go on because you jazz you like jazz any specific artists yeah i like basha like basha um spyro gyra um uh the radiance um uh, who else did I like? Um, it, it's, it's funny because you, when you ask me a very direct question, I should know an immediate answer. Um, I, I, I just have so many that, that they're just zooming by in my head as I'm thinking about them. Uh, and the same with blues. I mean, going back to some old Howlin' Wolf or uh, 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 some of sure. the, the, the classics. John Lee uh, Hooker. John Lee Hooker, of course. Uh, these, are, these are artists that created an original music art form uh, here in the United States uh, and maybe North American continent too, um, and um, created that music. That when you like listen to classic rock like Led Zeppelin or the Rolling Stones, they're they're blues bands. They're emulating music that came out of here, out of our you know out of our heart here in the United right. States and uh, and Canada. And uh, it, it's it's very interesting how that you know that extends into different genres. The Beatles, for example, uh, to, frankly, it's my opinion. Uh, mm-hmm. My age is showing through, so that's the disclaimer. Um, they created a, a style and a type of music that, in my opinion, has not been uh, challenged uh, since that genre of music uh, was out. And that's been, year, what, decades and decades and decades since the Beatles were out. Granted, there's a lot of different kinds of music styles out there, but nothing so earth-shattering as when they came on the scene, the whole British invasion uh, was uh, was very very pleasurable. Um, old songs that stick out of my mind. I can tell you some songs that, again that I hate. Um, Debbie Boone and "You Light Up My Life." 
Um, you may recognize the song. I'm responsible for making that uh, because I was the first guy to play it um, because it was suggested to me that I play it, and I played it. Um, and uh, it, it's like I unleashed this terror upon Philadelphia uh, in, the, in the name of that particular song. Uh, I, later in years, a friend of mine uh, was in a hot tub with Pat Boone, of all things, and uh, they were talking about music, and uh, my friend happened to mention, hey, my uh, my friend uh, played uh, Debbie Boone's first song. He said, yes, that was a damn good song, wasn't it? And he's like, he was fearing for his life in a hot tub with Pat Boone. Anyhow, crazy story. So, yeah, lots of different kinds of music. Uh, I have a music library behind me that includes 10,000 songs that were on the Billboard Hot 100 uh, from the uh, 60s through the 90s and uh it plays constantly like i can turn it on for a second what am i listening to uh we're gonna get our stream shut down you got to turn off that i can only do that for three or four seconds They're, they didn't quite get it i don't even know what song that was i didn't hear it yeah. long enough so uh, it, yeah we get a we get one strike that's okay it's when we get three that we get into trouble so we can't play music yeah. by the way we're not allowed right. to play music on this show because uh uh, YouTube has to protect that intellectual property, Mitch, I and want, I respect it. I just wanted to show you one quick thing before I even get in, get started. Gordon Lightfoot, most of course. people that because I have a certain look, most people think I'm just a metalhead. But uh, this Gordon Lightfoot album is awesome, and I listen to everything, like virtually every style of music, everything from classical to folk to the heaviest darkest black metal possible and actually by the way i just want to give a shout out to ronnie hosoy from our friends from uh, our friend from office hours he actually said he got i didn't know this about him he said that he got his start in a small youth radio station and he was running carts and doing audio mixing so that's how he got into the whole tech world of audio production way to go ronnie but yeah i ronnie listen to every, buddies. i uh, i listen to everything all sorts of styles of music uh, too many to try but I don't know what it was, you know, you know, when I started playing guitar when I was 13, 12 going on 13, uh, I just wanted to be a rock guitar player. And I was like that mostly into my 20s. And my dad exposed me to a lot of different uh, styles of music, uh, you know, everything from like Motown to, but mostly my dad was, you know, a guy who came from Greece, from Athens, and he was very heavily influenced by uh, the whole British scene and what was happening in the U.S. at that time with uh, with uh, Jimi Hendrix and everything like that. And then you got all those other uh, awesome rock bands from the 60s, like The Who and The Rolling Stones and all that. All Did those you ever get thrown out of bands, a music but... store playing the first uh, few <laughs> notes of Stairway to Heaven? You know, I've never that tried. That is a thing. I've seen people do it. It's not something I've ever attempted uh, just because, you know, after seeing Wayne's World, no, yeah, it's just silly. It's just, it's goofy. Well, but they're just, they're just... We used to get people that would we'd be doing a live remote somewhere, and this is like in the seventies, and uh, they people come by in a car, they roll the window down and go, "Free bird," you know, like that. They want to hear some Leonard Skinner, as as if, oh well, thank you. I used to, I, it got so bad that I used to say, if you, if you got a request, do you want to hear? Write it on the back of a twenty dollar bill and send it in. I'll be happy to play it for you. <laughs> so yeah, you have a very eclectic taste, and that it probably goes along with your job. And the fact that you're a musician, I had, I don't have a musical right. bone in my body. I dream great music. Um, I love to play in uh, music. And my favorite instrument happens to be a record player when I have one or a CD player. But uh, yeah, uh, all kinds of different. I think everybody and, and you should jump in on chat. Give me an obscure song that you like that normally you don't hear, but just jumps out at you like you showed that uh, Gordon Lightfoot uh, album cover. Yesterday, I just walked into my room. I've got again. I've got all this random music playing in the background because I have to have it, and it was playing. Uh, if you could read my mind, and I just sat down, and I listened to it for the first time in years, and it's a beautiful song. Uh, how that kind of happens, where a song can jump out at you, and that's a surprise because I wouldn't normally uh, curate a, a playlist with that song on it, or a song like Patsy Cline and Crazy. If you stop for a minute and listen. To a song that was recorded, what was that recorded in the fifties or sixties? Had to be the early sixties. It's so clean and well produced and uh, well recorded. Listen to it sometime. It's shocking the quality of the recording. And they probably had nothing more than a 
a couple of two-track tape machines. This is before the Beatles came along with four-track and eight-track players. But a lot of very uh, spectacular music was recorded back in the day without the technology. Today, technology, I think, sometimes gets yeah, in the way there's a lot of the of... melody. There was a lot. There's a lot of bad recordings out there too. I mean, I can I can certainly name quite a lot of. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mention names, but there's a lot of well known big bands with. Go ahead. Horrible. Give us a bad. Sounding. We want to hear a bad name. I, I could see. I'm gonna blank on. on the names, but Terry Jacks, Seasons in the Sun. Come on. There's just there's tons of there's tons of albums that were not that well recorded. And I'm picky about. I'm, I've got a sensitive ear to that sort of stuff. So, um, you know. I, I, I will say what was very well recorded uh, was a lot of the, uh, you know, the earlier jazz records that were put out on Capitol Records or Blue Note, right? I mean, you listen to some of those records, and of course, they've, they've been since remastered, but a lot of those albums just in mono have such an incredible solidity to them uh, that, uh, and you know, and I'm fascinated with recording techniques as well as, as an audio engineer. And just looking at all the the microphones that they used back then, ribbon microphones are, I don't know, for those that are not mic nerds, ribbon microphones have a special quality to them, uh, being like the RCA 44 is one of the most famous bi-directional ribbon mics. And that microphone to this day, which is now re recreated by a company called AEA out of California, they make incredible faithful reproduction of uh, of those microphones they actually have a lot of the original parts still and um those microphones are just incredible you listen to those earlier recordings like you listen to miles davis kind of blue the latest remaster on vinyl i mean that if you have a good system with good speakers that that record just sounds incredible i mean a lot of these blue well, note remasters certain, yeah, are certain incredible. microphones uh, pair up well with certain kind of instruments. Uh, you mentioned, mentioned an early uh, RCA. Um, how about the RCA 77 DX, the pill-shaped microphone? That's the the Larry King uh, uh, oh, yeah. microphone that you probably see on his set all the time. Uh, the one that's never used, them. by the way. That microphone is ne not active. It's that, That's the hilarious thing. It's just a prop. So yeah, with all these talk shows, you watch Jimmy Fallon and the, the Tonight Show, right? That Audio Technica microphone that he's got on his desk, that thing's not active. Yeah, some They're using Conan used and... to have a gold. Yeah. used to have a gold AKG like the one that's on your desk there, and I'm actually using one too, but I keep it tucked out of sight. Um, yeah, all that technology is wonderful, and it has different sounds. I have behind me, and I'm not even using it right now, is a uh, a Neumann U87, which is a classic mic. It was the first mic I ever bought. Well, no, not the first, maybe the second, but the first uh, mic I bought for my studio. And it's a U87, which has a very distinctive sound, um, and it's just so sweet. And uh, when you get a relationship with a microphone, whether you're playing a guitar, acoustic, or otherwise, um, you learn how to use that mic. There's a mic technique uh, right. that you can play. My AKG is a good approximation. Like, I know how to work it. Like, if I'm going to do a Don LaFontaine and go, in a world where people were gathered together, you know, I can... I'm sort you have a relationship with your that. microphone. You caress it or you say sweet. Absolutely, words you have a relationship. You know how to get here? the sounds from it. It's a, it's like an instrument, um, and sounds of uh, microphones is near and dear to the heart of any radio DJ or broadcaster. Absolutely, because the microphone is just as much a part of their personality as the quality of their voice. Now we don't have the big voiced announcer type voices that we used to have uh, back in the early days of radio. Now it's more natural. Uh, I've got an AM radio voice. I know it. I, I've always had it because I trained for it. And once I learned it and sounded like that, I can't undo it. You know, I'm sort of stuck with it. So I'm sort of in between being the radio announcer, you know, that kind of guy, and uh, the conversational announcer, which uh, people are used to now on the radio. So that's a whole subject into itself. We could. Uh, well, I have to say uh, that's a lot, a lot better than than having the vocal. You're familiar with the term vocal fry. I've probably asked you about this. You know what the, they that, talk like this. They it's it's, it's kind of a croaky, low energy sound. But I they talk, they I don't understand how anybody can have a career on the radio with that kind of voice. Just like no, no, low energy. No. You know, I'm just gonna. I talk. will personally hey, come. Everybody, I'm on the radio. I will personally come and spray Lysol all over you. Uh, or some other horrible thing. Uh, if I if I hear that as a professional, and some newscasters used to do that, um, some newscasters uh, 
used to talk like this. They would uh, they would com- they'd call it like compression like Johnny voice. Car- it's the Johnny Carson thing. Not, not so much Johnny Carson, but some. Uh, I I don't want to say this and make it sound like I'm being uh, uh, unfair, but some fe- early female uh, newscasters. Can I say female? Is that an accepted pronoun now? Woman, ladies, can't say girl. Uh, just just keep going. Just keep other going. gender. <laughs> Other gender uh, announcers, they used to talk like this. They would compress their voices so they could sound now, like was that fracking done on today. Pur- was that, is that something they did on purpose, or is that just like some yes. weird affectation they were born with? Yes, they did it on purpose to sound different. And um, there's nothing worse than a, uh, a radio guy that used to, you know, they don't do it anymore. But when we used to be on the radio, we talked at you. We didn't talk to you. Like if I put my, I'll, I'll do it just for a second because people are going to laugh at me when I do it. Uh, when I was on FIL, um, I would talk more like this. 855 on 56 WFIL, another great hit coming up on a million dollar weekend. That's a radio voice from the uh, 70s. It was kind of loud, speaking out and down, not two. And uh, it was it was affected. Um, if I did that today, I'd get probably laughed off the air. Uh, unless I was doing a uh, parody of some kind. Uh, anybody that does that, whether they're compressing their voice or fracking, as you're saying, is doing something that's not normal in co- in a conversation. And I believe me, one of the great things that uh, Office Hours taught me in the three years that I was on it is that I had constantly got feedback on, when I first came on the program, I was like, I came on like I was a radio guy. And that's not what they wanted. They wanted, you know, a more conversational voice, more real, more natural. And uh, with the uh, the uh, assembled multitude and, and, and Alex's coaching, um, I learned to bring it down. Not all the way, but a lot further down than it was before I started. So, yeah, it's a thing. People that change their voice to suit their profession, very bad. doesn't sound natural. And because of that, it doesn't sound real and it doesn't sound uh, legit. Sounds like you're talking down to them, somebody in some kind of a, in a weird way. Better to be squeaky voiced and normal than it is to be hyping, you know, a hello, everybody. It's 825 here in the great Southeast. And that's called a yucker. We used to have people that would smile so much on the air. Yeah, scatter the wax and splatter the platters. That's just, it's just a Yeah, I don't parody. know if anybody actually sounds like that. I feel like that's something you see in a movie where someone, actor, is trying to like do. Like you just said. Exactly. I, I, that's another thing that makes me angry because when they parody or, you know, if you're on Saturday Night Live or right. in a movie and it's on in the background, you got that radio guy talking like this, everybody. Uh, it's, you're right. It's done just because that's what people expect to hear from a parody of a, what a radio guy sounds like. Doesn't that make you just want to throw the remote control through the TV? Just like, come on guys, come on. You're better than that. No, it makes me want to do a podcast called The Last Angry DJ. Was anything pissing you off this week? What's pissing you off right now? Just anything, anything. Uh, Small (sighs) observations, walking in the street, you're at the supermarket, just someone... Any little, any behavior that you see that that irritates you now? Um, yeah, but you know, I don't know if you want to get me started. Um, probably the top thing is that it's very hard to go into public and start a conversation or make an observation without somebody thinking that you're either picking on them or you're being inappropriate. You just, you can't, it, it, it's like landmines everywhere. You're just going to step on somebody's toes. It wasn't always that way. But today you have to be so very careful as not to insult or upset somebody. I don't understand what that's all about. The other thing is ethnicity and things like that. I don't have anything against people of color or difference. But why do we have to draw so much attention to it? Why can't we just be people? And when we refer to ourselves, we're all, you know, here in the United States, we're all Americans and in Canada, we're all Americans. Why do Why do we have to go so hard? So hard to say. Well, he's he's an American Indian, or he's Italian, or he's Irish. I mean, why are we so obsessed with uh, tiptoeing mm-hmm. around these uh, ethnicity issues? Well, I don't uh, know. I, yeah, I feel that's, like that's got me going. I know it's very controversial. I feel to say like that, but well, that's no, I, I think feel. it's okay. I mean, we can. I, I'm happy to talk about it. I mean, my own perspective is a, is that a. Um, and there's a little bit of a difference, I would say, culturally between Canada and the United States. But here, I think the United States is more about being 
at least this is a Canadian's perspective of, of the United States, that the United States is a little more homogenous, or at least they want you to be like, you're an American. Uh, but the truth is, and the reality is that we all come from somewhere, right? So we're, we're, we all come from somewhere. In Canada, I think there's a little more attention to uh, respecting people's ethnicity and backgrounds and where culturally, where, where they come from and that sort of thing. So I think that to me, it's just a sign of respect to recognize where, where somebody is from or, you know, even if they were born in the United States, for example, and their families from whatever country, you know, there's just that we're, we're all different. We're all a little different. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a that's a good point. And I think people are in Canada just gen, my from my experience, gen, generally more mellow uh, about things in general. And that's that's good to be. I don't know why that is. I mean, why should I speculate on why uh, folks in Canada are, are much more relaxed and mellow about things? But uh, need, it, otherwise, I'm going to start picking on you. And now I'm going to be uh, yelled at for picking on Canadian. Mitch, Mitch Hill hates Canadian. I don't like uh, to say things like that. I, hell, I, w- I was born in Erie, Pennsylvania. That's as close to Canada. I might as well be Canada. Uh, when I was, uh, you know, a young kid, I grew up under that influence mm-hmm. in Buffalo. How do you spell uh, Erie? Erie, Erie, like Erie isn't like scary? E-R-E-I-E, like Erie, yeah. Okay. It's a strange, what's, what's it's the a strange deal with town that? because, what's that? What's the deal with that, with that name? Have you ever gone down the rabbit hole? Uh, it's what's obviously the history some it? kind of Irish uh, or German derivative it was a working town. It was a steel town. Uh, it was a small town on the lake, uh, probably because of the lake, Lake Erie. Uh, why they named it Lake Erie, I don't know. Uh, I should know all these things, but I don't spend my time in Erie so much anymore. It was a steel I did town. You get said? my first part. Part of it me. was a steel town. Where, yeah, steel where, town. Where's Bruce, was, Bruce Springsteen when you need him? I feel like there's a song somewhere. Something about a steel town. People working. Well, you're town. thinking of uh, Billy Joel, <laughs> Allentown. Uh, okay. But uh, Erie, uh, where I was born, and I, uh, we moved here in, when I was very young, maybe eight or nine, here being in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, I started listening to uh, a personality on the radio at WJET. His name was Ronnie Cash. And every time I'd go to bed at night, I'd have Ronnie Cash on the radio. And I thought he was just talking to me. And in fact, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I was actually in the studio in my bed, lying in a corner somewhere, trying to go to sleep while Ronnie did his job spinning records. So there was a fascination for me that started there and sort of stayed with me in some capacity so that uh, I ended up making a career out of it. But it's not so easy to make a career out of it today. I don't fit in quite the way I used to. So if I wanted to get on the radio again, um, it might be a bit of a task to do that because of the way radio is built. Well, that's why that's what podcasts are for. It's for the people. For, it's for yeah. the underachievers of the world that oh, uh, have no ouch. career. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. That's that's good to do that. Um, as as we get close to the end of uh, this great episode, by the way, great conversation, great uh, chat information. Thank you uh, for the chatting. Um, I want to uh, mention that next week we're going to have a comedian. His name is Craig Shoemaker, who I've known for years. He's a Hollywood level comedian actor writer, producer, philanthropist. Uh, He does all kinds of different things. Please don't miss the show. It's bound to be phenomenally good. I had him on my radio show uh, many years ago, so it'll be a sort of a reuniting. Uh, Craig is from the Philadelphia area, so he and I hung out at a very uh, sensitive time in our lives uh, back in the 80s, back when I was uh, just getting back out of radio and getting into the production. But anyhow, Craig Shoemaker, next Sunday on many of these same podcasting stations. I'm so looking forward to that. We have an amazing lineup of guests coming up in April too. That uh, You know, I, I think we're being a little secretive. We, we don't want to announce them now, do we? You don't want to announce them or no, you do don't we, remember do, who they do are? You wa- do you want to? No, I remember who they are. Yeah, I say who, they, who they are. Okay. I mean, let's tell, well, let's tell folks. For, for me, there's, there's one person that, uh, you know, and I've talked about this on previous episodes, but... Growing up, you know, in the 90s, back in high school, one of the most amazing radio stations was CFOX. And I feel like the 90s were just like p- the peak for that radio station in terms of the personalities that I, that I really liked to. And uh, one of the shows on that station was called The Larry and Willie Show. 
And those two guys were so entertaining, so funny, so great at just improv and just they were edgy at times. And there's really nothing there's been nothing quite like those two on the station. So like on any radio station since, in my opinion. And although that show isn't going on anymore, I, Larry Hennessy of the Larry and Willie show, Willie show, he's still he's still uh, on the radio on um, Jack FM, I believe. So we've got Larry Hennessy from the Larry and Willie show from C Fox uh, coming on, and he a lot of people don't realize this because they know him from the radio station. He's a mic nerd, and he has over five hundred vintage Ouch. microphones in his collection. He's a musician as well. We're going to talk to him a lot about that. So stay tuned because that's going to be coming up later this month. All right, looking forward to that. And I love the fact that uh, our our neighbors above the uh, the Great White North uh, have lots of very famous radio stations. In my day, I listened to CKLW, which was the big station in Windsor, Ontario, and uh, they were a trendsetter. I think they were an RKO station back in the day. I just remember they used to do things like it'd be like when the music stops, it's news on CKLW. Windsor, you know, they, that's where you kind of learn those big voice uh, announcer guys. So lots of guests. It's getting uh, interesting lining people up for it because we're kind of uh, the newlyweds, newlyweds, what am I saying? The newly born, uh, newborn podcast. So it's not 100% easy to call in and have people come on the program uh, that, that are wanting guests. But uh, you folks as uh, viewers and uh, listeners should suggest and you can do that by chatting or to, uh, I guess you can chat on the uh, podcast, right? Can yeah, you absolutely. That? You can chat, uh, well, on YouTube. If you join us on the live stream, you absolutely can. I just wanted to mention, we have an email address. You can reach us for now at, con- uh, not contact. It, the email address is hello at thelastangrydj.com if you want to shoot us an email. Uh, we're working on integrating uh, a Q&A system into our show because we'd like to have more questions. In a, um, we, need, we need a better way to to do that. So we're working on on the tech behind that. And, uh, yeah, we got some great uh, great guests lined up for April, so stay tuned for that. Uh, you can follow us. If you prefer the audio version, you want to you don't want to see these two mugs on the, on the show, you can, uh, you can listen to the audio version. Uh, we're available everywhere, Apple Podcasts, Google, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, all those platforms if you prefer the audio version as well. And I'll, I'll let Mitch have the, the last word. Thanks for every – by the way, I just want to say thank you. We have almost 50 subscribers in a matter of weeks. Uh, it's amazing. I know some of our, our friends from Office Hours have, have come over here, followed us here to support us. So thank you very much for that. And uh, we hope you're really enjoying the show. And I'll, I'll let Mitch have the last word. I don't have a la- – no. Of course I have a last word. I always do. I, I, I really appreciate the, your contribution to this. I think you're part of the secret sauce that makes this program work, uh, Alexander. So it's it's great to be here with you. It makes it so much easier to do it with somebody else that uh, can ask questions that, because you're curious about what it was like back then, back when you were a zygote. And uh, also uh, the folks on the chat, and it's always also nice to be reacquainted with some of our older friends on uh, office hours because we like, like the fact that they uh, find this kind of interesting and we get to see another part of uh, the personality. Alexander can be on, seen on uh, office hours on... Most days, which days you generally show up on office hours? I'm not on that often because it conflicts with my my full-time day job, but uh, I try to go on the show Fridays, Sundays, which is not live streamed to to YouTube, and uh, and Mondays as well. So those are the three days. Office Hours is a a great program. You can reach them at officehours.global, and uh, they're a, a good time to invest. You can hear and ask questions about tech, media related th- items it's a uh, it's a great uh, it's a great resource so uh in the meantime don't forget uh craig shoemaker our comedian guest uh, next week here on this same program we're going to do it live next sunday at five eastern time that's two o'clock pacific uh, we thank you for your time and uh, thank you for your questions and we'll see you toodaloo <laughs>